seated. God, we come to this building in UMass. Things have maybe gone well or maybe not gone well in our homes this morning. Regardless of what happened yesterday, regardless of things that happened this morning or even what's going to happen this afternoon, there's nothing greater than to celebrate, to sing about the amazing grace that you have given through your son, Jesus. The day that those of us in this room experienced freedom and those chains were set free, God, we just sing hallelujah for what you have done. Thank you, Jesus, for the work that you did on my behalf, on each person's behalf, Lord, on that cross. May we never ever forget that. May it be a day in which we celebrate every single day that amazing love and grace that you have for us. Lord, we look around and we're grateful. You've blessed us. you blessed us as a church, as individual families, even as a nation. And yet we know that there are brothers and sisters around this world who are being persecuted for the very faith that we celebrate this morning. Lord, for our brothers and sisters in Eritrea, a government that is just dominating in what they expect of their people to do or not to do. Can't imagine living like that yet, Lord. 
there are brothers and sisters who are living in that regime and just cling on in their basements and hiding places to your word. Encourage them this day. God, may we as comfortable here in the West just consider each week those brothers and sisters around this world who are in hiding, who are being persecuted. May they truly remain steadfast in their devotion to follow you. Encourage them this very day, Lord. Oh, it's a privilege that we have to continue praying for so many family members and friends and co-workers and neighbors who don't know you. Their names are symbolically on this cross, and God, you know who they are. You know they represent lives that we care about, that we love dearly. Father, draw them unto yourself. Maybe it's in the quietness of wherever they are today that they hear that their Holy Spirit's working. Maybe it's a neighbor they have who just shares the love of Jesus Christ. And maybe, Lord, it's, it's us who will have the privilege to have lunch with them today. We'll have the privilege to see them this week or to talk to them on, over FaceTime or on the phone. God, for each of the families here who are hurting because of their sons and daughters, because of their brothers or sisters or moms or dads or grandmas and grandpas or co-workers, Lord, they're hurting because they don't know you. We cry out to you, Lord, to bring them, draw them to yourself. There's no greater joy for us to know that another one has turned to follow you because of your amazing grace. Father, we've already prayed for VBS and Kids Venture, but it's an opportunity, Lord, that we're just crying out to you that your word goes forth and impacts the youngest of kids, not just here in our church family, but in our community as they come. Allow those men and women who are serving this week to, with conviction and with strength, share, be the very hands and feet of Jesus this week. Father, we also know our body continues to physically hurt. Members are healing. Some have surgeries coming up, Lord. Father, we recognize the giftings and the talents that you've given to women and men in the medical field, but we know that you are the great physician. And we ask, Father, that your will be done for each of them. You would encourage them that they would draw strength from you this very day. God, as Pastor Schoen comes to open up the word, Father, may we not just be listening, but may we open up our hearts and our ears so that we will change. We'll leave this place looking for ways to draw upon your strength and to trust you more and more each and every day. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Those kids in grades one to three may be dismissed for their church time. Moms and dads, if you don't know where they're going, you're actually welcome to go with them. They're going to be going right out through these doors. We have uh, men and women are standing out here to escort them upstairs uh, to their room, and then they'll be coming back down during the last song. Just want to let you know that, but if you want to join them as well, you certainly may. So, Pastor Dave. Good morning. I am Pastor Dave, a.k.a. Jared, who has a fairly decent sore throat today and thought he would be best served by saving his voice for Monday through Friday when he will be doing a lot of speaking and so on. So, um, yes, so you got me. I'm pinch hitting today and glad to do it. Just a couple things to start off with. Number one, uh, Yesterday uh, afternoon, um, someone dropped off, a, a farmer dropped off some produce. Now, they know the schedule of when we have food bank, groceries plus, and so on like that. But, and this is not the week that it's happening. So all that produce is going to go bad over the next 10 days before uh, groceries plus comes. So downstairs, 
on the table in the foyer where the four red doors are is going to be, when you leave today, there's lettuce, there's green beans, there's parsley. I think I saw one head of cauliflower, and I think it's kale. I just hear bad things about it. I don't really know what it looks like. But I'm just assuming if it's something that I don't know, maybe it's kale. Uh, but please feel free to head down there. They're going to have bags. Um, the Mel's are going to be down there. There's bags to load stuff up and everything. And you would help us very much by taking care of that and seeing that the tables are empty by the time the last person leaves this auditorium. Um, yes, so that's the, uh, that's the only thing we need for today here. All righty. Um, on August the 7th, 2018, in a village in Switzerland, some powerful hailstorm rained down on the mountains that were there. And it hailed big, giant chunks of ice. Uh, and then it ended, and everything was quiet. But as the hail melted into the ground, the ground began to get softer and softer and softer. And this is what happened. A landslide. If you think of a landslide, you think of just oh, some rocks tumbling down across the road. That's a landslide, a big landslide. Now, there was no deaths or injuries when these things came through, but there was a fair amount of property damage. I wouldn't like to be the maintenance people of the town that have to shovel all that stuff away. On March 11, 2011, a huge 9.0 on the Richter scale earthquake struck about 25 miles off the coast of Japan. Uh, it triggered a tsunami of unimaginable destruction. There are more than 15,000 people lost their lives. Uh, there were uh, 10,000 buildings were destroyed. It caused, if you, it's hard to forget, the catastrophic meltdown of that nuclear power plant there. Some of the the cameras that they had on, like, in the, in the streets and stuff, you know, captured some of the images. So the images isn't the best quality, but I think you'll get an idea of what it was like when there was nothing, and all of a sudden, there was a wall of water. I don't know if the car outran it. That's a tsunami, a tsunami, you know? We think of running away from a wave when we're down at the beach, you know, and just getting ahead of it and, you know, skipping through and every once in a while it catches you and throws you down. But what do you do when it's a giant wall of water that just comes through and wipes out everything in its path? As with some of the songs we've been singing this morning, health and financial problems, relationship issues, accidents or other unexpected events, whatever brings hard times into a person's life, they don't need to be of the catastrophic proportion of these things, but Psalm 46 is going to be speaking about it. They can bring about discouragement or fear or other things that we would label as difficult or perhaps negative emotions. So listen as I read from Psalm chapter 46. God is a refuge, is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. 
Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. We're familiar with the wordings of that. Uh, many, 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 many Christians are. As I was studying it, um, and knowing that I've been kind of called on at the last minute to prepare something, um, I decided I'd kind of get the jump on it. So I put this together a couple months ago. Uh, so, um, uh, so it was something that, you know, as I remember as I was studying this, this ended up being a very meaningful study, even if I never had a chance to share it. It was meaningful and helpful to me. Whenever there's translations, things from not only one language to another, but from one culture to another, it's hard to communicate exactly what the original readers of this might have thought and said to, you know, to what, for us to imagine what that was like. And so both in the languages of the Old and the New Testament, there are nuances of grammar that emphasize some words or thoughts when they're translated into English. Uh, and sometimes we can't grasp exactly what that is because we don't know what those emphases are. In our English language, we do have, we have what's called punctuation marks. And sometimes that can help a person know that if someone says, oh, or if someone says, oh, you know, the one has an exclamation point, the other has maybe a period or just dot, dot, dot. So we have some ways that we do that in our English language. Most, most of the time, it's just how we, how we say the words that, that, uh, that help us to understand that. So what I did is I tried to paraphrase, and this is just my expanded paraphrase of Psalm, 100 and, Psalm, Psalm, 1, Psalm 46, excuse me. And, uh, and that's what we're going to use as we, as we go through this to try to to put the, the main thoughts or what's to be emphasized in each of these various verses, uh, to put that uh, forefront. And so as we begin today, I uh, want to begin by um, looking at just the first three verses, because there's three thoughts to this particular chapter that I'd like to bring out today. The first is that God is bigger than every problem. Verse 1, God and God alone is our shelter. We can have absolute confidence in him because he has always shown himself to be faithful in the past. Notice there are plural pronouns there. This isn't just an individual. This is where it's talking about we, not I. It's talking about our, not my. It's speaking of God's people as, as a group, not just as an individual. For there is strength in community. Uh, where people generally care for one another, there's help, there's encouragement, there can be a guard against discouragement. For feeling alone can be a breeding ground for a discouragement and fear. We need one another. And that's why the body of Christ is so vitally important. That's why, though, during COVID, we sat in our living rooms and watched worship on television, and maybe even sang along, that that's not sufficient for a church because the body needs to be together. The body needs that help from one another. Uh, verse, it, it, the psalmist states what they know and believe, that God and God alone 
is their shelter. It says it's a very present help. It's not a reference to God's, to God's nearness or timeliness of his help. It points rather to the confidence that one can have in his care because he has faithfully demonstrated it in the past. It's the past and what, they, what they've experienced God doing for them that encourages them in the present. For God is able to take care of, there's no problem bigger, bigger uh, that God cannot handle. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. It's not the one, he is not the one who has the power to do this. He is not the one who, who can only do what we ask, but he can do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask. Remember words, the angel's words to, uh, to Mary after sharing with her that she was going to become the mother of the Messiah? She said in uh, Luke, Luke chapter 1, Nothing will be impo- was told, nothing will be impossible with God. That's true. That's a short statement. But nothing, nothing. Job 42, 2. Spoken from a man who was experiencing tremendous, tremendous hurt. And at the end of that time, as he is reflecting back on the heartache that he experienced, He says, I know, Lord, that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. You can do all things, even in the midst of the great heartache and physical pain and emotional suffering that he had during those earlier chapters. Note that the writer declares what they will choose to do. It's not something that would just happen to them. It's something that they make a choice, something that they choose to do. Therefore, verses 2 and 3, we, will, we need not fear whatever confronts us in the present. Why? Because of remembering his faithfulness in the past. We need not be afraid, even if the situation feels like being caught in a mountain landslide or swept away by a tidal wave or even rocked by an earthquake. Pretty significant things. It's not just, uh, you know, uh, the other about two weeks ago. I'm just walking along and, you know, just went to step off a curb and it just kind of twisted, just kind of turned your ankle, you know? And so what does it do? Usually what hurts for, well, a few days. And it, it was, and I happened to look down at my foot and, and my, after about three days, well, not, and not that I really stare at my feet, but, you know, I was putting my socks on one morning and I looked at, and this ankle is swollen up like a balloon. And it's all the colors of the rainbow. And I'm thinking, no wonder this hurts. And I played with it for about another 10 days until I finally thought, maybe I really did do something. So I went to the emergency care place last Sunday. And the lady goes, the lady goes, that's broke. You broke it. You, you broke it. So she takes, she says, but we're going to take an x-ray just to make sure. She takes the x-ray and she comes back in and she goes, I... I can't believe it, but it's not broken. Everything is where it should be. You just really, really, really sprained your ankle. But so now I, I can actually see the bump where my ankle is. So that's, that, that's where we're, we're making progress. So, you know, what's that compared to riding down that highway in Japan when all of a sudden you see behind you a huge wall of water coming and just taking all the cars and just plowing them all together. There's no way you can outrun it. He says, he says, our decision, our our choice is we need not be afraid. We need not be afraid. Why? Because God is bigger than the problem. Whether they be, in our eyes, minimal or in our eyes, catastrophic. And, you know, it doesn't have to be a tsunami to be catastrophic. Some of you folks have experienced some 
really, really, really hard times. And you know what catastrophic feels like. Yet even in those, the people, as they're, the people, what they were saying is, we, we don't need to be afraid. And many times, that's what we need to say first. We just don't jump on, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not afraid. You know, it's like, let me, let me think. I, I, I don't need to be afraid. Why? Because of how God has demonstrated his faithfulness in the past. And now I can trust him for this, even though I don't know how it's going to turn out. So many times it's not the old, I'm not afraid. It's convincing myself that I don't need to be afraid. And I have good reason not to be afraid. And there's that word that you see every once in a while in the Psalms, sila. And there's different, different thoughts as to what that is. Um, the one that I like, and so this is personal preference, I like the one that just basically means pause. And it's not like, well, catch your breath before you read the next verse. It's take some time and think about what was just written. Pause to ponder uh, what it is. And so let's do that. Um, have you experienced trouble, pain, heartache, loss, a time when it seemed that your world was falling apart? What events brought this about? By the way, these are written on the other side of your note thing. That's why you got a book in your, in your um, bulletin this morning. What fears surfaced in your heart and your mind? How did you respond to the situation? What did you do or try to do in order to calm your fears? So don't mean to, we're going to take five minutes and just have everybody think about that, but give you this maybe it's just a little exercise. You can pick a date and do this. Read through Psalm, 1, Psalm 46. Reread those first three verses and then spend some time. Lord, what, what do you want me to think about here in the light of what was written so many thousands of years ago? God is bigger than every problem. He is also present in every circumstance. Verse 4. Behold, God provides life and protection to his people. They flourish because the Most High God is present among them. He is like a river which, feed, which supplies life-giving water to the irrigation channels which it feeds. God's presence is pictured as a river which serves as a source of water to fill irrigation that went to the crops and helped to uh, give them the, the supply of water that they need in order to grow. Uh, and again, that was, that was a life issue. That was a life, a life issue there, for that's a very dry and arid region where water is a super precious commodity. We need water to live. Life is possible where water is found. Um, any of you fans of Homestead Rescue? Maybe Deb and I are the only ones in this whole place. Discovery Channel, I think, or Discovery Plus. The Rainies, Mart, uh, Marty, Matt, and Misty. And they go, they've been homesteading in Alaska for 40 some years. And what they do now is it's the father, son and daughter, and they go down and they go to places in uh, throughout the United States in order to help homesteaders, people who are trying to live off the grid and be self-sustaining, to be able to maintain that. Some of them are facing really difficult issues. And they have seven days, so it's real drama, um, to, to in order to fix the problem and leave to go on to the next rescue. Um, and it's interesting. It, has anybody seen that at all or just... Step in. Oh, okay, well, thank you. There's 15 of us. Um, the, the thing that is in almost every episode occurrence that needs to be fixed is a sustainable and consistent water supply. Why? Because if you don't have water, you can't live. 
and it's not reasonable as some of these places that they would go to fix where they need to drive 45 minutes to fill up barrels of water and bring it back to where they live so that they have water or they buy the water. So yes, when he speaks about God being this life-giving river, I mean, that would speak much to the, to the Israelite people that were there. They knew how important it was. They didn't have a tap you could turn on. Um, Acts chapter 18, verse 9 and 10. God's presence with them as this life-giving, life-sustaining water. The uh, Lord was speaking to Paul who said, Do not be afraid any longer. Notice, any longer. What does that indicate? Yeah, he, he, fear was starting to grab a hold of him. Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm. For I have many people in this city. Notice it's not just God there. I will, God is saying, I will take care of you. There's that sense of community. There's others of you. There's other believers in this city. You are not alone. A verse familiar, I'm sure, to you, Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. You are with me. God's presence. God's presence. He is there in every circumstance. God's presence provides security for his children in the present and the future. As surely as dawn follows night, God will faithfully help them, verse 5. God's presence guarantees security, security for his children regardless of what the situation is. God's power always accompanies his presence. Notice verse 6. Nations of the world may growl and roar at one another, and as a result, some may be destroyed. But God need only to raise his voice, and the entire earth would dissolve. The psalmist compares God's power, the power of nations, to what God's power is all about. Um, every day, Ukraine is in, is in the news. What Russia is doing, what Ukraine is doing, what the others are doing to help Russia, things that are ha to help Ukraine, some things that are happening behind the scenes in order to strengthen the Russians. There is, lot, you, you look at some of the news things, and there is great destruction. Cities are being leveled. Um, uh, there are armies bringing death and destruction. There are those that are the conquerors and those that are being conquered. God merely just raises his voice. And what happens? The whole earth disappears. Who has the power? That's the point of the psalm. Yeah, there may be... There may be uh, Bands of armies coming in, or it may feel like bands of armies just attacking that are relentless. He says, but just, just remember, their power is limited. All God has to do is speak. He doesn't even have to raise his, he doesn't even have to speak loudly to get somebody's attention. He just needs, he just needs to raise his voice. And everything in the earth would dissolve. Isaiah 41.10 do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God has a plan, and it's for his children, it's always, always good. And not only good for them, but good for the glory of his name. And his children are called upon to trust him, Romans 8, 28. I always like to pair that out with Psalm 84, where the psalmist writes, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. Uh, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. I always picture that as like God has this magic shield around us. And it knows the difference between what is good and what, it isn't, what isn't good. And so the stuff that God says is not good just bounces off. And the stuff that good, 
Eh, it just comes right on through. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Verse 7, the Lord, the mighty warrior king, is present with his people. The God of Jacob will protect us. It's a statement of praise, of mutual encouragement. The Lord of hosts pictures the Lord as overcoming all resistance, accomplishing his purposes uh, of what it is that he wants to do any time that he wishes. As the Lord of hosts, God is the supreme commander-in-chief over all the resources of heaven and the angels who are there who do his bidding. He is the leader, and he can accomplish everything that needs to be done. It's his presence. It is a stronghold. It's a secure retreat. It is a high place. It is well protected from attackers. It's sometimes referred to as an impregnable location. The root of that word means it's too high to climb. It just can't be done. So the Lord says to them, God is present in every circumstance. And then there's that word again, pause. Take some time to ponder what it is you've just read. Can you think of a time when troubling circumstances made you feel lost, completely alone and without help? I can remember being in the hospital, one of the numerous hospital visits that was done by uh, three of my kids. That's why I have the gray hair. Um, and just being there waiting for results and, you know, just being uncertain and just like, like you feel all alone. I'm sure you've had times like that as well. What encourages you to rest in God's presence during such times? Maybe it's scripture that you've memorized or know where to go to find in your, in your Bible. Maybe it's music. Maybe it's purposely chosen memories. Do you have certain things in your past that were greatly encouraging to you that when you need it, you can just sit and recall the time, the events, what happened, and you can replay those memories in your mind? If they encouraged you back then, they can encourage you again. Um, maybe um, music, um, memories, maybe you connect with, a, with a, you know, just a very trusted friend. You need somebody to talk to. Take this time, some time, this afternoon or when you would choose to read Psalm 46 again. And stop and ponder and think. The third reminder is that God is almighty in every situation. Verses 8 and 9. In the light of these truths, recognize God's great power and ability to care for his people. Remember the marvelous ways he has helped you. He's capable of defeating any kingdom or nation on earth. He can bring wars to an end because he has the ability to destroy armies regardless of how powerful their weapons may be. The emphasis there is on God's helping works. The ways he showed shows himself has shown himself strong on your behalf. He says, come, behold. Not merely just remember, but resurface these and allow the wonder and the amazement to work in your life again. God, when you read through the Old Testament, you see that God had, had done many, many things for the nation of Israel. Miraculous things uh, in, their, uh, in, in their history. And what I found something that was, I think, worth noting is that there are some of those things that they just keep bringing up over and over and over again. Not just over a short period of time. Um, you remember the things like the deliverance from Egypt, the water and the man in the wilderness, the fall of Jericho, the defeat of their enemies, and so on. But probably one of the biggest ones that loom is the crossing of the Red Sea. And so that event took place in Exodus. 80 or 90 years later, jo uh, Joshua is talking about that in his book, chapter 24, verse 6 and 7. 
The psalmist speaks about that in Psalm 106. That was 400 years after the event. Isaiah 51.10 speaks about it. That's 700 years after the event. And Nehemiah even brings it up again, a thousand years later. And I have a feeling it was brought up a lot more between then. These, these five people just didn't, what was that thing again that happened? It's, no, they're talking about something that was experienced by people that lived centuries before, but the stories had been passed on. Why? Because it shows what God had been done. He'd been trustworthy in the past, in the past, and he could help them in the future. Um, I hope you have some stories that come to your mind on a regular basis. Sometimes where God worked in a way to accomplish something that can be explained in no other way than what God had done. I once was told about, I guess, maybe 10 years ago, somebody in the church family, oh, a great, great person. I don't really, I just know they're a great person. I don't remember who it was. Um, but said, you know, you tell that story about when you, when you were in Russia on that missions trip, and the, the Lord supplied things for you to stand. I don't think you should mention that. You know, that, that's, we're getting tired of hearing that. Um, so I haven't said anything for at least 10 years now. <laughs> but it's time to break. Because I tell you, there is times that I, in my prayers to the Lord, I mention this. There's times when I dig out some pictures to look at them because it reminds me of what God did. How many here know the story? Ha, oh, you're in the minority. All right. Here it comes. Here it comes. Our puppet teams that we would send out to various countries, we have a stage that's six foot high because when you're out working on the streets or other things like that, there's rocks, there's glass, there's sometimes you know, drug needles and everything else. You're going, so we have a stage that's six foot high. Um, and you need to get the puppet to be belly button height, which is usually about there on your arm above right at where the stage is. So some, some of the kids need, need a little help, little help to stand. And so we use soda crates. That's what we would do in the past, use the soda crates, because you can stack them, and they're nice and sturdy. So we were going to... Not, Russia, Romania, Romania. Um, I had mentioned to the to the uh, missionary who was there the importance of having things to stand on, you know, and explain the soda crate, sent some pictures of it, and everything. So we don't have anything there, but we should be able to do that. And I would remind him every other month or so, and like that, as we were working up. So he said, "No problem, we'll take care of this." Um, the, the time came, we're in. We land in Bucharest, and we're taking this five-hour bus ride in order to get to Craiova, where we're going to be ministering. And so I asked him, I said, oh, have you been able to get those, get those uh, stool, those things that we need? Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot. We were supposed to do that, weren't we? But don't worry about it. We'll find something. Um, that was on a Friday. We get there on Saturday. We go. Uh, While well, the kids are hanging around with their youth group, to, youth group, we went to the market. He said, we'll find stuff here. Well, the market was closed. And the only thing that was there was like lettuce things that made it that really thin uh, wood stuff that just crush. He said, you know, you know, we, we need something. He goes, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. I said, but we're supposed to do a program at your church tomorrow. We need something to stand on. He said, we'll take care of it. So we're riding home, and uh, he needed to stop at a little mini mart in order to pick up something, some milk or something for his wife, I don't remember. Um, and so just being nosy, I wasn't going to say in the car, so I went and just was kind of wandering through the, along the, the aisles. And um, I did notice that there were cans. And I was just thinking, cans? I wonder if there's something we could do with cans. So when we get in the car as we're driving, he's taking me back to where, we, where we're staying. Um, he, I said to him, maybe there's ways that we could use cans. Do you have... I know I, in America we call them number 10 cans, those big round things. Um, we could take them and duct tape them together. I said, does something come in, in big cans? He goes, oh, yeah, peas. 
I said, I said, he said, how many do you need? I said, maybe 40. He kind of looked at me thinking, my kids aren't going to like this. But he said, we'll find something. We'll find something. We'll have it for tomorrow morning for church. Well, that morning, at, they were meeting at a uh, movie theater. Um, and um, he, he still hadn't gotten anything. So I told the kids to scatter, just look around wherever you could. We found some styrofoam things that we were able to at least stand up to do one song, get everybody up there. But then they just kind of crumbled under our feet. And I said, and afterwards, you know, we really do need this. He says, I'll take care of it this afternoon. Monday morning comes. We're working with Push the Rock. Basketball camp is set up at a school. Um, the basketball courts are down below and a little raised there. And then there's like the playground area. The school had been out for a month so far at, by the time we got there. And the... Um, uh, we set up the stage and everything like that, and and I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking for Mr. Millhouse, and things are supposed to start at nine o'clock. There are about maybe 120 kids all running around. We're supposed to take half of them, the, like the younger group, half, half that's younger, and we do our part when they do their push the rock part, and then after that we switch and we do the other one. So we're all set to go. And so I, I see Rich coming around the corner of the school. And I make a beeline. It's quarter to nine. And I said to him, something for our kids to stand on. Oh, yeah. And I'm thinking, this doesn't make sense, Lord. But we're here, and we can't do this. What's, what is plan B? I told the kids, just scatter wherever you can go. Find stuff that we can stand on. There is, they came back, there was nothing. They found a big rock, but they couldn't move it. And I'm just, you know, it's 10 of, and I'm thinking, um, and as I'm doing this, out of the corner of my eye, I see a dumpster by the school building. Eh. Walk over to the dumpster, climb in, and I actually have pictures of me in the dumpster. And I'm kicking around the stuff that's in there, and I clank against something. I just didn't pick it up. It's an empty can of peas. The label is still on it. There were 42 empty cans of peas in that dumpster. 42. We taped them together in groups of fours. And they lasted for all of our shows in Romania until we headed out to Russia when they fell apart. To me, there's, time, there's times sometimes when I pray, Lord, you are the God of the 42 cans of peas. And I am dead serious. I mean, that was amazing. Amazing. And I wish sometimes that I still had the emotions of what it was when I realized what it was that day. It's like, this is unbelievable. God knows we're here. God knows exactly what we need. Rich didn't know what he was doing. But all along, God was saying, just rest. They've been being washed by the rain. They've been sitting in there for a month since school ended. And they're all just waiting for you. And you don't need them until 9 o'clock. <laughs> and he gave them to us at 9, or at, at, at 10 of 9. And we, we did our program. Um, I will repeat that story to anyone until, maybe I'll even say I'd like it read in my funeral. <laughs> the Red Sea to the Israelites. Even a thousand years later, they're talking about, let's not forget what God did. Let's not forget. Let's remember. Let's remember. Don't let the next generation forget this. They won't be able to experience the emotions and everything that accompanied those people as they walked through and saw these walls of water on each side and what should be this mucky 
dirt and sand, and they're walking through on dry ground. And then just as they get across, it comes together, and all of a sudden this army that threatened their complete annihilation is gone. It's worth remembering. Worth remembering. I hope, I hope you have some of those type things. Uh, Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. There's a great, a great last line. 1 Timothy 1, 17. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only, only God to, to be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 11. The Lord, the mighty warrior king, is present with his people. The God of Jacob will protect us. There's that crescendo again of praise. Um, Sila. Pause for a moment. Think. Ponder. Amazing words. So what works of the Lord have you personally experienced? How has God worked in specific ways at specific times to accomplish what can only be explained is that the Lord did it. And if your memory is as bad as mine, you either have to keep repeating the same story over and over again, or you write it down. And writing it down is a good thing. Because it could be an obvious answer to prayer, way he protected you, timing or linking of events, sometimes the things that people might consider a coincidence, help to do his work. Uh, another question is, is prayer your first response when faced with a difficult time, or do you immediately jump in and begin your own plan of action? And if your answer is to jump in, that kind of a scenario, what might you need to do in order to cease striving and give God time to act or to help you see his plan? This is, that's one of my hard ones. I, I'm more of a doer. And so I can get involved in something and if a glitch comes or something like that, I'm thinking, okay, what do we got to do to fix this? Try this and this and this. And partway through that, when I'm, I'm, a thought comes to my mind, it's almost that like the Lord says, okay, I don't hear a voice. It's almost, well, did you ask me about it? And so I stop and pray. And it's uncanny how many times I look up and the answer is right in front of me, or the idea pops into my head, or I know exactly what it is that needs to be done. What one declares in times of calm and peace, however, doesn't always become reality when the test comes. I'm sure you can relate to that. I was reading an article, um, and the place the website is on, on in your notes there. Uh, this particular writer, Scott Hubbard, said, The promises of God often lose their power in our lives because God himself has become small in our eyes, lose their power in our lives because he himself has become small in our eyes. He continues on, we may be able to recite God's promises by the dozens, but in our hearts, God is no longer the king who conquers armies and cuts a valley in the sea. He is no longer the shepherd who seeks his sheep and keeps them safe behind his staff. He is no longer the Lord who walks on waves and calls the dead back from the grave. Slowly, subtly, we have forgotten God's power, God's wisdom, God's tenderness. And then he concludes with this. When the promises of God seem powerless to quiet our fears, soothe our grief, lift our worries, or motivate our obedience, we need to do more than simply hear his promises again. We need to behold the God who gives them. So with that thought in mind, as we close, turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. The context of this is, speaks about it in the first two verses, where it's anticipating the day when the captives of Judah would return to their homeland from Babylon. 
uh, was that was the near fulfillment of this. Verses three to five describe a further fulfillment referring to the Messiah's coming. Verses seven and eight is a reminder that God always keeps his promises. Then we see verse nine. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. And what is this God like? He is the almighty God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might. He comes with his arm ruling. He is the ruler. He is the king. He says, behold, his reward is with him. He is just and right and will reward his faithful children. Verse 11. Um, like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his, in his arms, he will carry. He, excuse me, let me start that. We try that one one more time again. Um, like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. He is the tender, he is the gentle shepherd. That's who our God is. That's who we need to behold. That's who we need to trust. Um, maybe you're here this morning, you need to catch a fresh glimpse of God, who he is, his power and might, the one who is worthy of praise and worship of, in every drop of our obedience. Um, we need humble, worship-filled recognition of God, the promise keeper, for he is the one who is the trusted one to keep his promises, and we can rest in his care, regardless whether the situation is a, a minor inconvenience or something that really rocks, relock, rocks our life. Um, and notice that this psalm is for his people. And we need to be a part of his family if we're to claim these promises. And that's only possible through faith in Jesus. Knowing the truth of the gospel, believing that truth, and then trusting Jesus as personal Savior and the leader of life. And following him and giving him our obedience. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for... Um, revealing to us in your word just how powerful and caring and loving and personal that you are. Thank you, Lord, for the times when you, you show yourself strong in unmistakable ways. Lord, I pray that you might give us good remembrances of such time. Um, thank you that you are aware of all of our situations and that you have promised to be that help that's needed in that time of need. Uh, Lord, I pray that we would be people who are able to, to rest in your care, uh, regardless of the circumstance, uh, for you are capable of doing anything. Indeed, Lord, you are the God of 42 cans of peas. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Shona's asked to sing this song. You'll find it on the back of your sermon notes. We're also going to put the lyrics up for you. But I want you to sit and listen to the first stanza before we sing it together. And really think about God as our shelter. shelter in the storm when 
troubles pour upon me, though fears are rising like a flood, my soul can rest securely. Oh, Jesus, I will hide in you my place of peace and solace. No trial is deeper than your love that comforts all my sorrows. Will you stand and worship? We're going to sing that again together. shelter in the storm when troubles pour upon me though fears are rising like a flood my soul can rest securely oh Jesus I will hide in you my place of peace and solace no trial is deeper than your love that comforts all my sorrows. I have a shelter in the storm when all my sins accuse me. Though justice charges me with guilt, your grace will not refuse me. Oh, Jesus, I will hide in you who bore my condemnation. I find my refuge in your wounds, for there I find salvation. be one in which by faith we not only choose to know the truth of Psalm 46, not only believe the truth, but choose to think and to act, to trust that God is bigger than every problem, He is present in every circumstance, He is almighty in every situation, for indeed He is God, the mighty warrior king, who is present with us and protects us. Amen. Amen. Uh, just a reminder is what was mentioned um, earlier during the announcement time. There is going to be a prayer time for Kids Venture. Uh, they'll be meeting downstairs in the foyer at the Family Center uh, just probably in about 10 minutes or so. If you'd like to join them for that, please feel free to do so for just a short time of prayer. Thanks so much for being with us this morning.